So, should we start now? Um, yeah, let's start. Let me see um, if I can share my screen here. Yeah, so today we have uh, the third lecture by Professor Nielsen, the population inferences in population genomics part two, right? Okay, thank you so much. Um, let me share my screen. So the last two lectures, we've been talking about population genetics. In the first lecture, we talked about basic models of population genetics, basic coalescence models. And then uh, last Thursday, we talked about um, demographic models, talked about uh, when there are multiple populations, talked about migration. Um, and uh, today, what we're going to talk about is natural selection. So much of many efforts in population genetics focus on, on uh, trying to identify natural selection. And one of the reasons why people are interested in natural selection, well, it's of course because they're interested in understanding how evolution works, basic principles of nature, but also because that if you can identify where natural selection is acting in the genome, that tells you a lot about whether there's something functional. Uh, so, for example, if you see, if you're studying a virus and see how the virus is evolving, the sites that might interacting with the host immune system that might be very important for vaccine design are sites that might be on a certain types of natural selection to avoid immune recognition. So you can use that, those kind of ideas that uh, uh, particular variants that are important functionally, they also tend to be under, under natural selection. So. Um, so we got to go more into detail with that uh, in this lecture and talk about first a little bit about how do you model natural selection? What do we really mean when we talk about natural selection? And then we're going to talk a lot about how do you identify natural selection? How do you find out by looking at DNA sequences if they have been subject to a certain type of natural selection? So the first thing we'll do is just to go through, uh, oh, first talk a little bit about, of course, the origins of natural selection. Um, you should all be familiar with Darwin's principle. Uh, he was inspired by animal and plant breeding, particularly animal breeding. He was really interested in racehorses, but also dog breeding, like uh, illustrated here by all these dogs in the, in the bottom of this slide. And what he realized was that humans have been able to select for all these different breeds, for example, horse breeds and dog breeds, by choosing every generation which individuals should leave offspring in the next generation. And his fundamental insight was that um, without any interference, something similar will happen in nature, where the in individuals that have certain characteristics that allow them to better survive or to better, better reproduce in nature, th those individuals that have traits that allow them to do that will also be selected, and thereby those traits will be selected. So he famously wrote, the, the, uh, famously wrote I'll call this principle by which each slight variation, if useful, is preserved by the term natural selection in order to maximize relation to man's power of selection. So natural selection is we're talking about uh, today, uh, not the uh, artificial selection that plant breeders and animal breeders are also uh, applying. Okay, so we're gonna talk a lot about the models and this is sort of a little overview. I'm gonna go through this slide here and give you a little overview of uh, some basic models of uh, natural selection. So this is a diploid model. So remember diploid means that you have two copies of the DNA, one that you inherited from your father and one that you inherit from your model. So there's three possible genotypes, capital A, capital A, capital A, lowercase a, and lowercase a, lowercase a, if there are only two alleles in a locus. Okay, so we're still gonna operate in that world where we assume there are only two possible variants. And for each nucleotide site in a DNA sequence, in most organisms, including humans, that's a reasonable uh, assumption. Then we talked about in the first lecture, how you can predict the genotype frequencies from the allele frequencies. So the frequency of the capital A, capital A genotype, that would be FA squared. The frequency of the heterozygous type, that would be two F capital A, F lowercase a. And the frequency of the lowercase a, lowercase a genotype, that would be F lowercase a squared. Okay, so we have these, uh, these are predicted 
genotype frequencies predicted from the allele frequencies. And the new thing we're going to do now, so this is all from the first lecture. The new thing we're going to do is we're going to assume that these genotypes have different fitnesses, okay? And how can we think about fitness? Well, fitness can actually be defined in several different ways and relates to that selection can be defined in several different ways. Sometimes selection is working on viability, so survivorship, and sometimes it's working on fertility, so that is on reproduction. But for this lecture, just to make things simple, we're gonna think about selection as acting on viability. So we're gonna assume that uh, uh, an individual are born initially in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium according to the frequencies you see here, and then some of them die, but some of them survive to uh, uh, adulthood where they can reproduce. And that's how we're going to think about how selection works, just to make things simple. And these fitnesses here, the WAA, for example, here, that is then the, you can think of that as the probability of surviving to adulthood to the reproduction. Okay. So that's one way to define the fitnesses. There are other ways to do it. So for each of the genotypes, we have an absolute fitness that tells us something about the chance of surviving to uh, adulthood so you can reproduce. Often what we do is that we define these fitnesses relative to each other. So we take one of them, uh, it's often scaled relative to the one that has the highest fitness, but that's not necessary. Uh, but uh, we define fitnesses often relative to one of them. For example, in this particular case, we define fitnesses relative to the capital A, capital A genotype. So the relative fitness of that genotype is then one, because we find the relative fitness by dividing all the fitnesses by the WA, uh, WAA fitness or the fitness of the AA genotype. So if we go to the heterozygous type, the capital A lowercase a type, the fitness there is then WA lowercase a divided by WAA. So we standardize with the fitness of the AA genotype. Now we can write that in a different way. We can write that in terms of what's called selection coefficients. And that's these S's here. So you often heard, will hear that term, the selection coefficient. And that's then defined as, uh, in this particular case, such that uh, the fitness, uh, the relative fitness here is equal to one minus the selection coefficient associated with capital A, lowercase a. Okay, so the selection coefficient here is the reduction in fitness of the heterozygous type of this capital A, lowercase a, relative to uh, the homozygous capital A, capital A type. And then we do the similar thing for the lowercase a, lowercase a genotype. It has fitness, absolute fitness, W lowercase a, lowercase a. We standardize that to get its relative fitness by dividing by WAA. And then there's a selection coefficient here that is the reduction or represents the difference in fitness between the W lowercase a, lowercase a genotype and the w, w, WAA or the AA, capital AA uh, genotype. Okay, so those are the relative fitnesses. We standardize by the fitness of one of the genotypes. All right, so now we're all set up. What we want to do then is to be able to, to calculate, well, what happens in the next generation? Um, what will be the allele frequencies in the next generation? And it turns out conveniently that we can write that as a function of the allele frequency that already was there in the previous generation, and then what's called the average fitness of the population and the marginal fitness of, of, of the allele that we're interested in. So let me just explain those concepts. So we have the average fitness here. So the bar above the W, that means it's an average. And we get that by simply taking the fitnesses of all the different genotypes and multiplying them by their frequency in the, in the, geno in the population. So remember F A, if capital A squared here, this term, that's the frequency at which we observe capital A, capital A genotypes. So we take their fitness and multiply it by their frequency. And we do the same thing for the heterozygous, take the fitness of the heterozygous individuals, multiply it by the frequency and the fitness of the lowercase a, lowercase a individuals, and multiply it by their frequency. So that's the average fitness in the population. Now we also define something that's may, maybe a little harder to understand. That's a marginal fitness. It's sort of the, the, the fitness a proxy for the fitness of the capital A allele. And the way we calculate that is that we, um, as we say, the capital A allele itself doesn't have a fitness. Only, only genotypes have a fitness where you've got a combination of two 
So there's not really a real fitness of the capillary allele, but we cal calculate something that's similar to the fitness uh, of the capillary allele. And the way we do that is we imagine that you have a capillary allele and you're asking, what's the chance that it is in each of the three possible genotypes? And then we wait with the fitness of that genotype. So if you take a random capillary allele in the population, ask, what's the probability that is, for example, in a capillary A, capillary genotype? Well, that would be the probability that the signal allele we sample, if we already have a capital A, is also capital A. And what's the probability of that happening? Well, that's just simply the frequency of the capital A allele. Okay. So we have a term here, a first term that is the probability of being in the capital A, capital A genotype times the fitness of that genotype. If you, so if you are in that genotype, if you sample a capital A, what's then your fitness? That would be WAA. But then of course, what could have happened is instead you sampled a lowercase a allele. And if you, that you do with probability one minus F capital A, in that case, you would be heterozygous and this would be your fitness. Okay, so this is how we define the marginal fitness of uh, um, capital A. Now, what we can do then is now we can start write down equations for uh, the frequency in the next generation. And the way we, we can do that is that we can count all up all the capital A alleles uh, and divide by the total number of alleles that are segregating in the population after selection. So what we would do is we would take, uh, find the total number of, of alleles segregating as taking the fitness of the different genotypes and multiply them by their frequency. Okay. And that's exactly what the average fitness is. Okay. So we'll get a term, we'll, we'll look at the allele frequency next generation, we'll get denominator that, sim, that is the average fitness. But that also simply re, uh, represents uh, the number of the proportion of individuals, relative proportion of individuals left in after selection has been act, acting. So how many are left after, relatively uh, after selection has been acting. And the numerator we'll get by taking the frequency of Cavalier alleles, and uh, or capital A, A individuals after selection, uh, and then and then half of the capital A lowercase a individuals uh, after selection, uh, and when we do that, that reduces exactly to the marginal fitness. So without going through all the algebra uh, for you, um, I've sort of presented a little argument for why you end up with this expression down here that the allele frequency in the next generation, we can write that with a little bit of high school algebra. If we work on this, it will come out as the average fitness of the Cavalier allele, the marginal fitness of the Cavalier allele. There's a bar here that I don't have up here. Uh, that's just a typo, don't uh, worry about that. Uh, times the frequency of the Cavalier allele divided by the mean fitness of the population. Okay, so now we have something, an expression, a very simple expression where we can calculate if the selection acting in the population after one generation, how, how would the population look after two generations? How will the population look in terms of the frequency of capital A? So now we can uh, work on the math of that and try to figure out what uh, is, for example, the probability that A eventually goes to uh, fixation. And I'm just gonna, um, uh, for a second, go back to the PUBG program to, uh, to, um, to just help build a little bit of intuition about this. So we're going to switch to that for a second. Oh, I am yes. yes, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Victoria, <laughs> please. It's okay. Okay. Um, um, yeah, so you could all see the PUBG uh, program screen here, right? Yes. Okay, good. So remember this program, this was a program that we used to simulate genetic drift wells to gain some intuition from that last time. So let's do another, uh, just to remind you of that, let's do a population here um, in which there's genetic drift, but no selection. Okay, the blue line here is the expected frequency in next generation. And then the, this line here is a, a random trajectory that's been simulated in a population size of 100 individuals. All right. So what happens if we um, if we if we uh, now add selection? So we can add, add selection to this by changing the fitnesses. So for example, here we could set the fitness of capital A, capital A to be one, and then the fitness of 
the heterozygous type to be 0.75 and the fitness of the last type to be 0.5, for example. And then we get a quite different trajectory. The allele frequency will, of capital A will increase and eventually it will go to fixation with very high probability. So uh, this blue trajectory here is what we would get if we take that equation I had before, that was the frequency of the allele times the marginal fitness divided by the average fit fitness. If I take that and then iterate that and plot that over many generations, you'll get the blue line. And the black line that's hard to see here, that is a single realization of a population where there's both natural selection and genetic drift. So let's, let's do a few more no runs with that. Let's do some, an, some no populations at the same time. And uh, no, maybe that was not what I did. Let me see here. Population size, generation of population to run, 10. All right. So you can see here we have various trajectories around uh, the allele frequency, the deterministic allele frequency, but they all tend to uh, do the same thing. They end up, uh, allele frequencies end up with capital A going to fixation. Uh, so that's what you would expect if selection is as strong as this. But we can try also with a little bit weaker selection. So let's make a, a case here now where the selection coefficient here is 0.95. And here it's, or the fitness is 0.95, and here's 0.9. And what you'll see is that it takes longer time for the mutation to go fixa to fixation. And there's perhaps a bit more stochasticity around this trajectory. Okay, so when selection is weaker, it's not surprisingly will take longer time for the selected allele to go to fixation. But you also see another effect that the effect of the drift seems to be a bit stronger. If you're sort of gonna uh, talk about the relative effect of genetic drift and selection, genetic drift plays a more important role now. We could take a more, more extreme case where there's only very weak selection, because it is to 0.99 and 0.98. And then you can see the allele frequency changes very slowly and there's a lot of genetic drift. In fact, you could argue that much of the dynamics here is really dominated by the effect of genetic drift and not uh, by selection. Okay, so this is sort of uh, a basic uh, selection model, how it works. In the case that I chose in which capital A was favored. So the fitness of capital A was, all, was of the capital A, capital A genotype was higher than the heterozygous genotype, which again was higher than the lowercase a, lowercase genotype. So that's a case that we call um, directional selection because there's one of the alleles that always, the more that you have of them, the higher fitness you have. So it's illustrated down here. So there, in the, by directional selection, it's one of these two cases where WA, the fitness of WA, WA is always larger or equal to AA, lowercase a, which is larger or equal to lowercase a, lowercase a. Or it's the capital lowercase a allele that's uh, favored. So the fitness of lowercase a, lowercase a is always larger than the fitness of, of capital A, lowercase a, which is always larger than the fitness of capital A, capital A, larger or equal to, I should say. And that leads us to then the one exception, that is when this is all equal to, that's an exception for, from this, then uh, we talk about neutrality. When the fitnesses of all the three genotypes are the same, there's no selection active, right? There's no differences in fitness. And we talk about selective neutrality. Okay, so that's no selection. But if either of these equations hold, but not with uh, equality throughout, then we talk about directional selection because one of the alleles will uh, be favored uh, over the other alleles. Now, um, that's the case of directional selection. There are two other cases to look at. And the first one is the case of overdominance. So for overdominance um, is the case where the fitness of the heterozygous type, the capital A lowercase a type, is always larger than either of the two homozygous types. So you're best off if you're heterozygous. Now, why might that happen? Well, we have some there's some examples of that that we have. So some of them, for example, relates to the immune system. If you have two different alleles, then you can defend yourself against a bigger set of possible viruses. And because of that, it's better to be heterozygous than to be homozygous. So that creates overdominance. 
There are another famous ex example, sickle cell anemia in, in some African populations is controlled by a mutation where uh, if you have that mutation in two copies, you get a severe disease that's called sickle cell anemia. But if you only have it in one copy, so you're heterocytous, you don't get sickle cell anemia, but then you're protected against certain forms of malaria. So the two homozygous type have least fitness. In one homozygous type, you get malaria. The other homozygous type, you get sickle cell anemia. But if you're heterocygous, you get neither malaria nor any, uh, or sickle cell anemia. So your, the highest fitness is for the heterocygous types. So this type of ore dominance actually can occur uh, quite a lot. All right, so we're gonna, now I've been talking a lot, uh, so I'm going to give you a question and send you out in... Uh... Uh, Rasmus, excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, we had one question from Victoria. Okay. So uh, let's hear the question. Let me see. Is that in the chat? Uh, no, I think it's uh, on voice. Okay. Uh, Victoria, please. There are two questions in the chat. Um, but I, um, I have one question from the previous lecture. Oh, okay. Uh, um, okay. Uh, you showed us a table uh, that illustrate um, uh, some information about P. I can send it, send it in chat. And um, you ask a question and after it, um, uh, you explained uh, that um, uh, the model was wrong. And I not actually understand what mean that model was wrong. Okay, all right, so let's talk about that a little bit. So just for everybody else, so they know that what we're talking about. We're talking about when we were looking at the average number of pairwise differences and relating that to the effective population size. And we, we looked at different human populations and looked at what was the average number of pairwise differences in different human populations. We've already shown that the average number of pairwise differences is an estimator of theta, four times the effective population type times the mutation rate. So based on that, the populations that have the highest population size, they should also have the highest value of theta. So they should also have the highest value of pi, the average number of pairwise differences. Now that's not what we saw. In fact, the ones now, whether the most individuals, the Han Chinese, the major ethnic group in China, they had a smaller value of average number of pairwise differences than some of the African populations will where there are very few individuals in those populations. So somehow there's something wrong here because you would predict that the populations with the largest population size, they had the largest value of uh, high, the average number of pairwise differences. So why is there this discrep discrepancy? Why is there this problem? Well, it's because the model we have assumed is a model of a constant population size for time. We assume that the population has not changed its size ever effectively. That's what the basic assumption of the model. And that's wrong for many human populations. So in particular, the Han Chinese, since the invention of agriculture, they've had this very strong growth uh, uh, in population size. They had changed population size very strongly. And in the past, they experienced these bottlenecks in the population size. That is, there have been periods where they had a very small population size. During those periods, they lost all the genetic variation. So because of that, today, even though they have a very large, large population size, they don't have so much genetic variability. So our predictions about what was, uh, how to interpret average number of pairwise differences was wrong if we only thought in terms of a, a population of constant size. size. That model is, is, is not, not right. Does that answer the question? Oh, yes, thank you very much. And there are the questions in the chat. Okay, I can't see the chat without sharing. Uh, so uh, there is uh, actually now one question in the chat. Uh, could you please give more explanations about Tajima's estimate and about the examples in the previous lecture? Okay, um, you know what? We'll get back to Tajima's estimate a little later, actually. I'll be talking about it again. So maybe we can, um, we can, and I can answer that question a little later when we get to that. Would that be okay? Uh, sure, thank you. Yeah, because we will re revisit uh, Tachim's estimator. Um, let's go back to selection. Can you still see my screen here? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, so um, so so I like to um, 
pause now uh, for a second with the selection uh, work and um, or the description of selection and then just ask a question to you, um, particularly uh, related to over dominance. And this is something, the answer to this question, you can work on that mathematically, but that, that's not what you're supposed to do here. Just think about it very intuitively. So assume the situation where there is strong over dominance. So that means that you we're also going to make a symmetric, so that means that the fitnesses of the two homozygous types are the same. And then let's look at, uh, and then also assume that the fitness of the heterozygous type is much larger than either of the two other homozygous types. Okay, so that's a case of, or, again, or dominance, the heterozygous type has highest fitness. Then what happens when the frequency of the A allele is close to zero. So imagine it's a very low frequency, the capital A allele. Well, uh, so you could, you know, formally, if you want to do mathematically, you would look at in the limit of, of FA close, close to zero, but you don't even have to think about that like that. Just think about the A allele having a, a very small frequency. What then will happen to the frequency of capital A? Will it tend to increase or will it decrease through time? And there's a hint here that if A is close to zero, there'll be no or extremely few capital A, capital A individuals. All of what you will see in the, in, the, in the population effectively are lowercase a, lowercase individuals or heterozygous individuals. All right, so we're gonna do some, uh, some uh, breakout groups. Um, and I'm gonna keep this screen up just so you can, uh, you can look at the question there. And maybe I'll also, uh, I'll see if I can put it in. Oh, it doesn't help in the chat because you can't see the chat in the break, breakout rooms. So I'll start the breakout rooms now, and then we can talk a little bit more about that. Sorry? Oh, maybe that was not anything for me. All right, I'm going to start the breakout rooms now, and we're going to do um, maybe uh, you know four or five minutes in breakout rooms. So please join the breakout rooms. Breakout rooms. Um, anybody have an opinion about this question? Feel free to just unmute yourself. Um, otherwise, I'll choose a breakout room. Well, in my room, I have some things to say. Sorry, Dmitri. I gave you up. Oh, okay. I, I can say things, but I would prefer if you chose breakup room. <laughs> okay. Should I just choose breakup room? Um, all right. So I'll choose breakup room two. So that is, and I'm sorry again about my pronunciation of the names. Uh, Lydia Dysiatkiana, uh, Nastya Dudovskaya, Olga Klimenkova. And a name in uh, Cyrillic letters, in Russian letters that I can't read. I'm sorry about that. Anybody want to say anything? Uh, we decided to uh, watch at F A B K three divided by F A from allele frequency in next generation and look at it and. Uh, we decided that it's uh, uh, more than uh, one, so uh, it's tend to increase, increase. Yes, that's right. So it will tend to increase when its frequency is very low. Um, good, very good. So, so one little argument, sort of intuitive, non-mathematical argument for this is that if the frequency of capital A is very low, then again, there will only be the only type of individuals that are in the populations are lowercase a lowercase individuals and lowercase a capital A individuals. The capital A capital A individuals will be extremely rare because it will be, if FA is small, it, the frequency of them will be something very small squared, which is really small. So you don't see many of those. So we also know that the frequency of the heterozygous individuals is higher than the homozygous individuals. So that means that the individuals that carry the capital A allele 
they have higher fitness than the ones that don't carry their capillary allele. And for that reason, capillary will tend to increase. The homozygous, lowercase a, lowercase a type, they have the smallest fitness. The capillary, lowercase a type, they have higher fitness. And, and since these are the ones, the heterozygous individuals, these are the ones that carry the capillary allele, then the capillary will tend to increase over time. Okay, so something similar will happen um, when uh, when something similar will happen when um, uh, capillary is really large. In that case, uh, the similar argument will will show you that capillary will tend to decrease if it's really large, if it's close to one. So what will happen when you have overdominance is that when the allele frequency is low, the frequency of the allele will increase. And when the allele frequency is high, the frequency of the allele will decrease. So there will be a, what's called a stable polymorphism. In fact, if there was an energetic drift, it will evolve in, uh, towards an equilibrium frequency that in, is intermediate between zero and one. And by taking the equation I had before, you can derive it quite easily what that equilibrium frequency will be. So we're not going to do that. But if you take this uh, equation here for the allele frequency in the next generation, and if you set Fa prime equal to Fa and solve for that, you can figure out what that uh, allele equilibrium allele frequency will be. Something intermediate between 0 and 1. Of course, this equation will also be true if Fa prime is 0, 1. But those are the uh, cases that are not interesting. The ones that are interesting are the interior ones between zero and one that the population will tend to evolve to. Now, the, the last case we haven't talked about is this one down here, the underdominance. In this case, the heterozygous individuals have a fitness that's less than either of the two homozygous individuals, right? So you're worse off if you're heterozygous than if you're homozygous. That's a situation you see very rarely in nature. But just for completeness, we'll also deal with that one. That will kind of do the opposite of overdominance. It will tend to push the allele frequency either towards zero or towards one. Okay, so that uh, when you are in this situation, um, the polymorphism will tend to be lost. You'll end up, depending on where you start, will either having only Cavalier, Cavalier individuals or lowercase a, lowercase a individuals. And that's maybe may also perhaps the explanation why you don't see this much in nature, that uh, these kind of polymorphisms are unstable. They tend to be lost with time because natural selection will tend to uh, get rid of the polymorphism. Okay, for the sake of time, maybe I won't go more into that. But let's talk, just talk about some different types of selection. So what I've talked about previously is the sort of very basic ideas about if in a very simple model where you have two loci, uh, or sorry, one locus and two alleles, how does natural selection work? But of course, you have many more models and ways to think about natural selection that biologists think about. So first of all, you have, I, I presented selection as viability selection, that it was made up surviving until adulthood and be able to uh, reproduce. But in fact, fertility selection can also occur where it's a matter of who is best at reproducing. So that has to do with the process of finding a mate uh, and other things that has to do with how many offsprings you produce. So there can be a lot of uh, uh, these types of selection acts somewhat differently and uh, opens up for something that I'll talk about in a second that's called, also called sexual selection. Then you can also have frequency dependent and fluctuating uh, dependent selection and fluctuating selection. What, the way I described the selection model was that the fitnesses were constant in time. They never changed, but that might not be true. The environment changes all the time, and therefore the fitnesses might change all the time. So you get fluctuating selection. Similarly, there are ways of thinking about selection where the fitness will actually depend on the frequency of the allele. If you get these kind of selection, that can lead to other forms of what's called balancing selection, selection that maintains polymorphisms in the population. So remember, if you had over dominance. That's what you were trying, that was what we we're trying to argue before. Selections tend to favor an intermediate frequency of the allele. So it maintains polymorphisms in the population. Other types of selections, such as frequency dependent selection and fluctuating selection, can do the same, can have the same effect in some situations. These are all examples of what's called balancing selection. It will balance a polymorphism, it will keep a polymorphism in the population without it being lost. 
And in the early days of population genetics, people thought that the reason why you see so much genetic variation is because of this balanced selection. Now, most people think it's, well, it's mostly a, a consequence of just mutation and, select and, and genetic drift. But balancing selection certainly also occur. Another type of selection that biologists often talk about, very important, is, is sexual selection. So that has to do with how you select mates. Uh, so, for example, uh, classical example is the peacock with its very, very shiny feathers, where the females, they tend to prefer to mate with males that have these very shiny ornaments, these big, big feathers. And because of that selection has favored those feathers to become larger and larger and larger. And there's a whole body of theory on how this works, on sexual selection, on how that works. And no, notice it's, it's not in some sense how well the organism uh, is able to survive in its environment that we're talking about now. We're talking about how uh, it's, it gets access to reproduction. And that can drive a whole different kind of dynamics and a whole different form of evolution. Then you have other forms of selection that has to do with uh, basic questions that evolutionary biologists have struggled with for a long time. That is, how can uh, non-selfish behavior evolve? So for example, if you're a bee and you sting uh, a predator or you sting anything, you will kill yourself. So with bees, when they sting, they actually die from it. Um, so why would you ever have, why would natural selection ever have favored and the evolution of, some, of, of something like that, of suicide, essentially. And that's explained by uh, theories that has to do with that kin, what's called kin, that has to do with that they increases the fitness of their relatives by doing so. In this case, they live in a beehive and they increase the fitness of all the other bees in the hive by sacrificing themselves. So there's a whole mathematical theory for that that's called kin selection. And there are also other types of selection is based on groups where uh, by increasing the fitness of the group you belong to, you can also increase your own fitness indirectly in that way, perhaps your offspring's fitness. And so there could be group selection that also can be acting. That's a very controversial topic. There's still a lot of research going on, on on group selection, how that might work. But these are theories that are being used to explain how natural selection can evolve traits that are uh, selfish. Okay, so why would you ever uh, sacrifice yourself for somebody else? And there are many, many, many nature of that, of animals doing that. So selection doesn't necessarily uh, favor selfish behavior. Sometimes the highest fitness comes from unselfish behavior. And there are lots of, of theory on that. All right. So just a little bit, maybe I'll, maybe I'll just jump over, over this part here. Uh, um, and just go directly to this, uh, which relates more to the data. Okay, so from models of natural selection, uh, of which I gave an example of a model like that, you can again predict what a frequency spectrum will look like. Okay, and so remember the, the site frequency spectrum is, it gives you the distribution of allele frequencies in the population. So this is an example of some site frequency spectra here. On the x-axis, you have the allele frequencies of different mutations in a sample of 10 diploid individuals. So it goes from one to 19. If it's variable, you also could plot zero or 20. That's not plotted here. And on the y-axis is the percentage of the polymorphisms, the percentage of the SNPs of the variable sites in the genome that where the mutations in that site have this particular frequency that you see down here. So for example, down this one here, that is uh, mutations where the derived allele, the mutant, has a frequency of one out of 20. And what the gray bars tell us is that in a sample like this, almost 30% of all mutations should be like this. So that's a neutral expectation in gray. And almost 30% of all mutations should have a frequency of one out of 20 under neutrality. Okay. And now we can think about what does natural selection do to this? I'd like to, you to ignore the yellow bars for now and only look at the blue and the red bar. So we can think of two types of selection here. Positive selection, that selection that acts in favor of a new mutation as it arises. So you imagine you have a new mutation, it gives a fitness benefit to the individuals that carry it. So that's positive selection. That mutation, the new mutation will be favored. We can contrast that with negative selection. Selection is acting 
against the new mutation. So individuals that carry the new mutation that just arose, they have lower fitness. And so we can model, we can simulate a model what happens if we have positive selection or negative selection. What will the frequency spectrum then be? And here so is an example for some values of the selection coefficients. So what you can see is if you look at the blue ones, that's positive selection. The allele frequencies have been pushed to the right. These high mutations that frequency segregate in a high frequency out here, there are more of them. Why is that? Well, the mutation, the new mutations are being favored by selection. Okay, so you have a higher frequency of them. Uh, and, and so they end up having, you know, you end up having more of these mutations of high frequency. Negative selection is the exact opposite. Selection is acting against the new mutations. So the new mutations tend to have a lower frequency. You get pushed towards the left in this frequency spectrum. You will have many more mutations of low frequency. There'll be relatively many more mutations that segregate in a frequency of one out of 20. These are all the relative frequencies. So each of the gray, blue, and, and red columns, they all add up to one. It's all the percentages here. So that you get relatively more, you don't have more mutations as such, but you have relatively more that are in the frequency of one out of 20 if you have negative selection. So selection changes the allele frequencies in the population. Positive selection increases allele frequency. Negative selection decreases allele frequencies. Okay, so that's one thing that we can look at if we're going to try to uh, detect selection. Often, to be able to detect selection, what we do is we take advantage of the fact that mutations in protein coding genes occur in two, uh, exist in, in two flavors, there are two types of mutations. Mutations that change the protein and mutations that don't change the protein. And that's because of the degeneracy of the genetic code. So remember, the way the genetic code works is there's a triplet of nucleotides, free nucleotides, it's called a codon, encodes one amino acid. Okay, there are 20 amino acids, but there's 64 possible uh, triplets of codons. So there's some redundancy there. So for example, if you have something like this, DCT, that codes for the amino acids, alanine, but so does DCA also codes for alanine. So if you have mutation from DCG and that mutate, the G here mutates to an A, that's what's called a synonymous mutation. It doesn't change the protein, okay? But let's say that G has changed, instead it was the, the C that had changed to an A in the second position here. Then instead, you would have a change from this amino acid, alanine, to glutamic acid, another amino acid. So that would be a non-synonymous mutation that changed the protein. The point here is if you go along with the DNA sequence in a protein coding gene, you can divide the mutations into two categories. The ones that change the protein, the non-synonymous, and the ones that don't, the synonymous. And since the proteins are the ones that are doing the work in the cell, selection should primarily work on the non-synonymous ones. So one way to look at selection is we can look at is a different behavior for non-synonymous mutations than for synonymous mutations. Okay, so I have another question for you uh, based on, on what I've just explained. We have here this from a real study. We have here site frequency spectra, plotted slightly differently than what you did before, but basically the same thing for non-synonymous mutations and for synonymous mutations, and then also the neutral expectation. So this is a sample of human data and in the blue line, you have what the theory predicts about the site frequency spectrum. Okay, so that's what we would expect to see um, if, you know, under standard neutral model of a constant population size and so on. Now, what is seen in, 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 the, in the data for the synonymous rotations, the ones that don't change the protein, that we think are not very much influenced by selection, is what we see in the green. And what we see for the non synonymous mutation, the ones that do change the protein, is what's seen in purple here. Okay, so these are the non synonymous mutations that change the protein. Okay, so given what I've been explaining so far, I'd like you to combine this information to explain this graph for me. Take the information from this one. How does selection change the little frequencies? And this idea about non synonymous and synonymous mutations to then explain this graph. What does this frequency tell, spectrum tell us about selection in humans? 
Okay, so I'm gonna, I hope the question is clear enough and I'm gonna send you out in uh, groups and breakout rooms again for again, uh, for five minutes to discuss this. So please join the breakout rooms. But I, I can try. Okay, please do. Uh, so when we have uh, by uh, x axis we have uh, like the number of non synonymous mutations. So if if we there uh, there is a there are little amount of such non synonymous mutations, we have that the relative fitness to another. Uh, Relative fitness will be higher. So, but when when we have only a small amount of non-synonymous mutations, so by uh, y-axis it will be it will show that the you know, higher proportion of individuals. But if we go on x-axis to the right, it will, we will like have more non-synonymous mutations, but it, it will be. It will ri 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 rise less, uh, like fitness individuals, so the proportions will be lower. Yeah, and so what does so and so what's the conclusion about mutations in humans? So probably that na natural selection will give more opportunity to that individuals that has a small amount of uh, non-synonymous mutations. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, so the major conclusion, I think what you said was right as far as I can see. I mean, the major conclusion here is that the, there's a difference between the synonymous and non-synonymous, right? And that the non-synonymous have many more relative to synonymous of these mutations of low frequency here. And that's what you tend to see if there's negative selection. So let's Let's go back to um, to uh, to this figure here. Hold on, this figure here, and talk about that again. What it means. So remember the side frequency spectrum. What that is on the x-axis, you have the frequency of the mutation, uh, and on the y-axis, you have how many of the different mutations have that frequency. So, for example, the gray bars here. That's the frequency of mutations that have a, uh, the proportion of mutations in the genome that have a frequency of 11 out of 20 in this example. Uh, numbers here go from one to 19 because uh, they are, it's the 10 individuals that are diploid. So you have 20 copies of the DNA. So you, I'll have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on, on up to 20, but we only plot them once, we only count actually are polymorphisms that actually are variable. So we don't include the zero and 20 category. So this gives us again, the frequency of different mutation classes where we stratify by allele frequency in each, each class. So again, about 30%, if you look at the gray bars here, about 30%, almost 30%, 29%, of all mutations should have a frequency of one out of 20 in the sample. You would expect about 15% of the mutation to have a frequency of two out of 20 in the sample. You would expect about 10% of the mutations to have a frequency of uh, three out of 20 in the sample and so on. And what we saw here, my argument before was, if there's negative selection, you get many more of the ones to the right here. You get many more of these mutations that have a low frequency in the population. And if there's positive selection, that's the blue columns, you get many more relative to the gray of these that have a high frequency. Okay, so what negative selection does is it creates more mutations of low frequency. So it pushes the side frequency spectrum to the left. What positive selection does is that increases the allele frequency. So it pushes the side frequency spectrum to the right. Now let's go down and look at this picture. What you can see here is the non-synonymous mutations, they have been pushed to the left relative to the synonymous ones and relative to the neutral expectation. That means that negative selection is acting on non-synonymous mutations in humans, most likely. 
It could, of course, also be positive selection acting on synonymous. We don't think that for two reasons. First of all, they're the synonymous mutations. They're the ones that shouldn't have an effect. And also because that frequency, that spectrum looks kind of very much, much more like what we expect under uh, neutrality. So the way we interpret this is that the non-synonymous mutations here, there are way many more of these uh, mutations of low frequency, and that's evidence of negative selection in on non-synonymous mutation in humans. So selection in humans is against new mutations that changes the proteins. And that shouldn't be surprising. The proteins have been over millions and millions of years, natural selection have been working to optimize them. Most mutations that changes the protein are probably deleterious. And that's what we can see here, that natural selection is acting against mutations that changes the protein. And the way we can see it is by this, that the proportion of mutations that are uh, in non-synonymous sites, in, of non-synonymous mutations that are of low frequency, that that is higher than it is for synonymous mutations. So the distribution of the allele frequencies is different for non-synonymous and synonymous mutations. And that's what tells us about natural selection uh, in protein coding genes. We model this so we can make mathematical models based on the model before we do some extensions of that model, but we can basically model how much selection should there be to explain this. And if you do that, you'll get in humans that 80% of all non new non-synonymous SNPs, so that's mutations that change the protein, must have selection coefficients in a range where they're negative selected, but not so deleterious that they will never be found in the population. And why are we saying that? Because of course the mutations that don't, they're never found in the population because they're too, there's too strong selected, selects, too much selection against them. You never see them. So they don't go enter into this calculation. Okay, but to get that pattern that we saw before, we can show that 80% of non synonymous mutations must be at least slightly deleterious in humans. There must be some selection acting in them. So there are a lot and a lot and a lot of mutations occurring all of the time that are deleterious, that reduces fitness. So you can think of much of what we're doing in terms of natural selection, we're being bombarded constantly with new deleterious mutations. And some people will have to leave fewer offspring in the next generation for that not to accumulate over evolutionary time. And that's basically what's going on. Natural selection here means that some people that didn't reproduce into the next probably uh, next generation, most, most of the time because of reduced viability. So we carry around with us this load of all these non-synonymous mutations, all these mutations that reduces our fitness. Massive load we all carry around. And some of us will die because of that. And only by some individuals dying uh, or evolutionary time has, you know, that's the sort of the, the mechanism by which uh, at just a constant accumulation and increase in deleterious mutation is uh, avoided. So uh, accumulation of deleterious mutation is, is certainly something that is uh, a very important feature, feature of the evolution of any organism and much of the selection that's occurring, the vast majority of all the natural selection that occur, occurs by uh, weeding out new uh, deleterious mutations that are entering into the population. All right, so that's negative selection we talked about here, and that's clearly is dominant. So there's a lot of negative selection we think occurring in, in, in all organisms, and it's an important feature of organismal evolution. But we are particularly interested in then finding the cases where there's positive selection. Okay, so why are we particularly interested in positive selection, even though clearly this negative selection, the deleterious mutation is all more important. Well, because the positive selection, when there's new mutations that are favored, that tells us something about how organisms evolve new form. Okay, how you adapt to your environment. So if we have to have, adapt to a new environment genetically, you have to have new mutations that come in and are positive selected. So there's a lot of interest in trying to, can we find mutations that are positive selected? How do we go around doing that? So much of that has to do with finding the patterns that is left of uh, a new advantageous mutation that increases in frequency in the population. That process is called a selective sweep. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, what a selective sweep is. Okay, so imagine now you have a population here to the left. Each of these lines represent a haplotype or chromosome that is in the population. The stars here, those are different mutations that are there. 
then imagine that there's a new advantageous mutation that happens. It being advantageous means that individuals that carry that mutation, they have higher fitness. And because of that, this mutation will increase in frequency through time. So if nothing else is going on with a high probability, eventually you will have a pattern like this, that the mutation has gone to fixation. All individuals in the population carry that mutation. All right. Important feature of this is then also that if there's no recombination, it's not just that mutation that increases in frequency, it's that whole chromosome. So the pattern you will see after it's gone to fixation is a pattern like this, where also in the neighboring regions in the genome, all the mutations have gone to fixation, the ones that were linked to that mutations, or they have been lost if they weren't sitting on the chromosome on which the new advantageous mutation arrived. So for example, this mutation here, that wasn't sitting down here on this chromosome. So after uh, selection has been acting, you don't see that mutation. Okay, so that's what we call a selective sweep. The mutation increases rapidly in frequency and it sweeps out all the variation in the region. In the end, you would get data like this where you see there's no variability. All the DNA sequences are the same. If you calculate the average number of pairwise differences, you find they're none because all the sequences are identical to each other. All right, so that's a selective sweep. Now, one thing that will modify that is this process of recombination. And for the ones of you that come from mathematical science, I'm just going to remind you about what recombination is. It's the exchange of genetic material uh, during the process of production of gametes, of uh, 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 sperm cells and egg cells. All right. So what happens is that you have chromosomes from your mother and from your father, and they will swap some DNA between them doing uh, the production of these uh, of, of egg cells and sperm cells. And so when you look at the egg cells and the sperm cells that have been produced, they will be a mixture. The chromosomes in them will be a mixture of DNA from the father and the mother. You will swap around genetic information from the maternal and the paternal chromosome. Okay, because of that process of recombination, these chromosomes are being scrambled through evolutionary time. So it could be, in fact, because of this process of recombination, that you get some of the mutations, like this mutation here, that didn't sit on that chromosome with the favorite mutation, that some of those mutations might actually be preserved after the selective sweep, because there was a recombination between the chromosome on which that mutation sat and the one that carried the advantageous mutation. So you can imagine after this mutation arises, it increases in frequency, but then at some point there's a recombination that happens here between these two chromosomes. And then this mutation over here gets put on the chromosome that carries the advantageous mutation. And by the time the selective sweep is over, by the time the advantageous mutation has gone to fixation, a few of these chromosomes here will carry this other mutation. Okay, we talk about those mutations that have escaped by recombination. So the consequence of that is that a selective sweep will, really, will result in a spatial pattern where really close to the advantageous mutation, where there's been little opportunity for recombination, you will see this pattern of no variability. But then as you get further and further away along the length of the chromosome from the location of that adaptive mutation, there'll be more and more variability uh, that is recovered because there will have been more and more recombination. So we can, if you can look at a plot, for example, of this, where we look along the length of the chromosome here. So the x-axis is the length of the chromosome. That's a chromosome here, all right? And the particular position of a chromosome where, where an advantageous mutation arose. And I'd like you to just look at the, at the black lines here. That's the amount of variability you can plot. These are from some simulations you plot, uh, the amount of mutations that you see. And right around the position where the advantageous mutation occurred, variability is low. And that's because it's been removed by the selective sweep by the process of the advantageous mutation going to fixation. But if you go further away, more and more variability is recovered and you go far enough away from the location of the selective sweep and everything looks like as if there hadn't been a selective sweep. It looks like it would under neutrality. So you get the spatial pattern along the length of the chromosome that you can use to look for selective sweeps. And so one of the things people are looking for is low variability. Okay, I'm gonna uh, jump over this coalescence theory on uh, 
on selective sweeps because I think maybe it's a little bit hot. And we've also got to jump over all of this, uh, these models here. Instead, I'm going to go uh, directly to, to this uh, and talk a little bit about what is the pattern then that we will see in the genome if there has been a selective sweep like this. Okay, um, so, so this, as I talked about, um, the selective sweep, the effect of it is to remove variability in the population. Okay, so if we look at the intraspecific variability, intraspecific, that means within the species in a population, we would expect, and I'm already gonna, I'm gonna tell you sort of the answer to the question I have here, then that selection will reduce variability. Okay. Now, other processes can reduce the amount of variability in a in a, in a genetic in a genomic region. For example, negative selection. If selection acts against new mutations, that will also reduce variability. So you can see here, I put in here interspecific variability. That's variability within a population. The effect of negative selection it will reduce uh, variability. Mutation rate could change. So if you increase the mutation rate, intraspecific variability will increase, but if you decrease the mutation rate, it would decrease. Okay, so just because there's reduced variability doesn't necessarily tell us that there's been a selective sweep. Instead, we need to uh, look at, um, at other uh, processes. Um, uh, um, or we need to look at other uh, evidence to be able to infer if there's been a selective sweep. All right. So uh, just to make sure people, you know, are on board with what I'm saying here, um, I'd like you to uh, fill out these uh, question marks that I have here in this table. So in this table, I mentioned different forms of selection. Uh, and the effect on interspecific variability, that's how much variability, for example, average number of pairwise differences or number of segregating sites, how many mutations you see within species, between species, that's the interspecific, and then the ratio of the two. And the reason why we're doing this is that it turns out the ratio of the two, if you look at how much variability there is within species versus if we compare different species, that's the interspecific, is very informative. Okay. So I'd like you to fill out, figure out what are the answers to these three. This one I always gave, already gave you, but I'd like you to repeat it just to make sure and give the argument for why that is the case. What is the effect of a selective sweep on interspecific variability? Then also, what is the effect of balancing selection? So remember the definition of balancing selection, that's selection that increases variability within populations such as over dominance. And then also answer, what is the ratio of interspecific to intraspecific variability? Okay, so that is another breakout room question. Okay, so the ratio means if we take the interspecific and divide by the intraspecific variability. That's what the ratio means. So what is the effect of balancing selection and selective sweeps on interspecific variability? And what's the effect of, of a selective sweep on the ratio of intraspecific and interspecific variability? All right, and notice here for the interspecific, I said no effect on mean rate of substitution here. And I'll explain why I say that afterwards. But uh, this is that there's really not much effect of a selective sweep on the mean amount of interspecific variability on differences between species. And I'll explain that after we have talked uh, about uh, or after you had had the opportunity to discuss these. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send you out and break up rooms for a few minutes again to again try to discuss these issues. All right, welcome back. Um, so do anybody want to talk about uh, what you discussed in your breakout room about this? Any volunteers? <laughs> 
All right, let me, um, I'm gonna choose a breakup room. Let's just take, we'll take breakup room one, for example, here. Uh, Dima, Silventoinen, Margarita, um, Yasnia, Yasnaya, sorry about this, Nikita Shirev, Svetlana Shikota, and something uh, I can't read in uh, Russian, in Cyrillic letters. Any of you want to uh, let us know what you discussed? I take that as a no. Um, all right, let's try break up room two. Uh, Lydia, Dishiakina, Nastya, Dudkovskaya, Olga Klimenkova was in that group. Professor Nielsen, I can uh, try to answer your question about okay. balance and selection. Uh, in my breakout room, we thought that may uh, increase or decrease. What about selective sweep? Uh, it may uh, just only decrease. And uh, uh, about the third uh, question, uh, it uh, should be increased only. Okay. We, that's all. <laughs> okay, good. Well, that's good. Thank you. Um, yeah, let me tell you what, uh, I mean, that's almost exactly what I would say. Uh, so let me, let me just show you what uh, uh, I would say. So balance and selection, and I haven't talked so much about it, uh, is this over dominance? We talked about the other forms of balancing selection. It can also occur if there's frequency dependent selection uh, or uh, in other models. And the definition of balancing selection is selection that increases the variability in the population, like over dominance does. So, per definition, it will increase. Maybe this was a little unfair because it didn't talk so much about balancing selection, uh, but that's the answer to that one. Selective sweeps is really what we're interested in here. And remember what selective sweep does, it's this selection of an advantageous mutation that then as it increases in frequency in the population, removes all the other variability. It sweeps through and in the end, all the DNA sequence are identical to each other. So it strongly decreases interspecific variability. There's a decrease in interspecific variability, the amount of variability within populations. Now, I'll also say that there's not no real effects on interspecific variability or differences between species from a selective sweep. And the reason why I say that is that I write here linked neutral sites. So we're only looking at all the other variants that sits in the region, not on the advantageous mutation itself. And it turns out, I haven't shown that to you, but the average effect of them is nil. It all cancels out. So if you look at the ratio of interspecific to interspecific variability, that will be increased. There will be more interspecific variability and less intraspecific. This decreases, this stays the same. So the ratio of this to that increases. Okay. And so that's a feature that's being used to try to detect positive selection. The challenge here is that the pattern left by natural selection, which is this reduction of variability in a region, could happen by other. Uh, reasons. For example, mutation rate could be different in that region, or there could be negative selection in that region, but none of those things would increase this ratio. So if we look for patterns, what has caused, what, where is the evidence of selected sweep? This ratio of interspecific to interspecific variability is a good thing to look at, because if we do so, we should be able to pinpoint what is the effect of a selected sweep and distinguish it from for example, changes in the mutation rate or negative selection acting. So that's at the core of many, di several different methods for detecting selective sweeps. So we, one way to look at it is to look at, again, taking advantage of non-synonymous and synonymous mutations. Okay, and there are a number of different ways for detecting selection based on that. And in the interest of time, I'm going to jump, drum, skip some, one of the methods. 
and instead go to this method here. So this is a, one of the most common methods for detecting selection in the genome. It's called a mcdonald kreitman test, named after the authors of the paper that first proposed this. Uh, and what it does is it looks again at non-synonymous mutation and synonymous mutations and looking within species and between species. And the idea is, is that the change in the ratio of the within species to this between species, the intraspecific to the instaspecific variability. And this test takes it a little bit further. It looks at non-synonymous and synonymous mutations and say, we think selections should mostly have been on the non-synonymous mutation. So if this ratio has changed between non-synonymous and synonymous, that may be evidence of a selection. Okay, and we can in fact show, and that can be shown rigorously, that in expectation under neutrality, if there's no selection, the ratio of within two species between species variability in non-synonymous mutations should be the same as the ratio within species to between species variability in synonymous mutations. And when I say variability here, you can think of it as just counting the number of mutations. So you count the number of mutations that are segregating within the species, the number of SNPs, in a region compared to how many fixed differences there are between species. And then you stratify by whether the changes are non-synonymous or synonymous. And then you can test if these ratios are the same using a standard test of uh, homogeneity in a uh, contingency table like this one. So you can use, for example, a chi-square test or another similar test to test if these ratios are the same. So people are doing that all the time. It's one of the most important tests for trying to detect selection. And the thing is, because of the things we talked about before, if there's more variability within species in non-synonymous sites, that might be an evidence of negative selection. But if there's more between species, that might be evidence of positive selection. So you can make a map like this of the human genome and find all the places in the human genome where there's either positive or negative selection. So you can look at all the different genes in the human genome in the population genetic data and ask, where do we see natural selection? And this is an old paper. So if we did it today, there would be many more genes. But the red ones are, are genes where the mutations that are segregating when negative selection is acting on those mutations. So there's mutations where we, there's so many mutations that are negatively selected that, we can, uh, that there's significant evidence of negative selection. So where them require multiple deleterious, many deleterious mutations. The blue ones are the ones where there's some evidence of positive selection. So these are various places in the human genome where we think right now, selection might be acting in favor of some new mutations. Uh, so that's positively selected genes right now or in the recent history of humans, positive selection has been acting. So you can make a map like that and find genes under positive and negative selection in the human genome, and then try to figure out the biology behind uh, the selection that's going on. Okay, here's another test that's also being used. So that was the mcdonald Cry test. Here's another commonly used test, the HKA test. It's somewhat similar to the mcdonald Crichton test, but instead of looking at each gene at a time and then comparing non-synonymous and synonymous fixed and segregated mutation within and between species, it then compared different loci. So it compared this kind of uh, information. It has segregating sites. That's the intraspecific variability. That's variability within the species. And then fixed differences. Those are, that's the intraspecific variability, differences between species. And again, it counts them then for different loci, for different genes in the genome, for different positions. You can choose, you can divide the genome into any way you want, but you can show that if there's no selection acting, these ratios in expectation should be the same. In average, these ratios should be the same. If you take segregating sites to fixed differences, interspecific variability to interspecific variability in different genes in the genome, that in average should be the same. So if there are significant deviations from that, so if this is not true, that tells us that selection must have been acting at least on one of those loci, one of those genes. Okay, so that's another very important test. It again is come because we know a selective sweep leaves a pattern of reduced genetic variability and will increase the number of fixed differences relative to the number of segregating sites. We look, we compare different genes in the genome, look at how many segregating sites and fixed differences there are, and then use that to detect where might there have been a selective sweep. The footprints 
of recent positive selection in the genome. Okay, so here's an example of that. One of the, I think, first examples that were published where people uh, did this test. Uh, this is in humans, at least. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, first one in humans. Uh, this is from a paper that's almost 20 years old now. They take different uh, human populations. Then they look at a locus where people think there might have been selection in that DMD. And then they look at different uh, positions within that gene, different introns. So remember, the structure of protein coding genes are organized in exons and introns. Exons contain the genetic material that codes for the protein, but interspersed between these exons are the introns that don't code for the, uh, uh, for the protein, that doesn't specify an amino acid sequence. And so what they do here is that they compare two introns. So those are their two loci, the two regions in the genome, intron 7 and intron 44. And for each of them, they calculate S, the number of segregating sites, that's the interspecific variability, and D, the uh, divergence, the interspecific variability, the fixed differences between species. So for each of the regions of the world, they then can make a two by two table like this. And then they can do a chi-square test for the HKA test and get a chi-square value for this test of homogeneity. And that then results in p-values. And you can see there are some of these p-values that are significant because the chi-square test or chi-square value is large. For example, this one in Asia here where if you look at intron 44, there are 10 fixed differences and 27, or sorry, there's 10 polymorphisms, 10 segregating sites, and there are 27 fixed differences. But if you look at intron seven, there are zero segregating sites. There are no polymorphism. There's no interspecific variability, but there are 39 fixed differences between species. And the species they're comparing to is they compare human to chimpanzees. So there's, there's this paucity, this de depletion of segregating sites. There are no variability within the species. This is exactly the pattern that you would expect to see if there has been a selective sweep. And in fact, these authors interpreted this data as evidence of natural selection, and presumably a selective sweep in intro seven that has, has most strongly affected people in Asia. I might have affected all the populations too, but perhaps most strongly people in Asia, at least they have the strongest evidence in Asia. Okay. So that's the HKA test. That's the whole exercise before on looking at variability within and between species and how to use that is used. Uh, that logic is used in this test. Okay, so I promised in response to a question before to go back to um, this question about uh, Tajima's estimator. Okay, and what uh, of the number of uh, of, of, of theta. And I mentioned before that there are two different estimators of theta. So first of all, just to remind you, what is theta? In population index, when you just say theta, it's four n mu, four times the effective population size times the mutation rate. It's a, a scale product between effective population size, how many effectively breeding individuals are in the population and the mutation rate. And if we think of it as the fundamental population genetic parameter, because it tells us in the absence of selection and other processes, how much genetic variability there should be in the population. And we have two estimators for this. We, have, we can do one where we take the number of segregating sites. We simply count the number of mutations. That's Watterson's estimator, the one to the right here, uh, left here. We take the number of segregating sites, that's S, number of sites that are variable in our sample, and we divide by this scaling factor here. Okay, so that's just a constant that depends on n, the sample size. That's a correction for how many individuals we have, if you want. And based on that, we can estimate what theta should be. All right, and that just is derived very simply by getting the expected number of segregating sites as a function of theta, and then rearranging this equation to divide a method of moments estimator of theta. All that, similarly, we have this other estimator, Tajima's estimator. Okay, in Tajima's estimator, what you do is you take the average number of pairwise differences in your sample and equate that to theta. And the derivation is similar as a, you get the expected number of pairwise differences and that turns out to be equal to theta. So if you take the average number of pairwise differences, that is an estimator of theta. Okay, so notation is slightly different here. Here KIJ is the number of nucleotide differences between two sequences, sequence I and J. 
We take the sum of that overall pair of sequences and divide by the number of comparisons you've done, which is n choose two, the n sequences in your data sets. So that's n choose two different pairwise comparisons. These are both unbiased estimators of theta. Okay, so both of these estimators under ideal condition in average will give the true value of theta if the model is correct. If this basic right Fisher model or the corresponding coalescence model of a penmetric population of a constant size, if that model is correct, both of these estimators are unbiased, so then average will give a true value. But sometimes they give very different estimates. Okay, and why might that be? That might be because the model is wrong. And so an indicator of some a problem with your model being wrong is vastly different estimates between these two. One of, one of the reasons why the model could be wrong? Well, it could be wrong because there's natural selection. That's one of the possibilities. So the way people formalize that, and that is uh, originally uh, proposed also by Chadima, the one who developed this estimator up here. He also proposed this uh, test of neutrality to test if there might have been selection to see if the model is compatible with a neutral model or something else might be going on. But what it does is it takes the difference between these two estimators, the team's estimator and Watterson's estimator. And then to, he standardized by the standard deviation in the uh, difference in, in the estimates. And that can be what this denominator is, can be derived onto this standard neutral model that can be derived uh, analytically. And that's what he did. And then he proposed to use this as test statistic. So Tatima's D here, this D invented by Tatima, measures how different these two estimates are from each other. And if they're very different, it tells us that that standard neutral model of no selection and a constant population size uh, and a pan population, that that model is probably not right. And one of the explanations why it might not be right could be selection. Okay. So, so that's one way. Um, Maybe I'll, that's all I will say about the, oops, about the GMSD for now. But it's a very common way of trying to test for uh, selection is to find regions in the genome where D is either too large or too small as candidates where there might have been natural selection in the genome. Okay, another way to try to detect selection is by using FST. And I'll also bring this up just to remind you of FST from last lecture. FST measures differences in allele frequencies between populations. And one of the reasons why there might be differences in allele frequencies is because one or both of the populations might have been under selection. So for, if you imagine that in one population, suddenly you have a new advantageous mutation, it increases in frequency, there's a selective sweep in just that population. And now you compare this population to another population, you will find there are a lot of differences in that region where the sweep was, there's a lot of differences in the allele frequencies between the two populations. So if you go along the length of the genome and calculate FST in different parts of the genome, regions of the genome that have a large value of FST, so FST close to one, might be regions that have a uh, positive selection, or has, uh, sorry, at least have some kind of selection, uh, possibly positive selection. So this figure here, what this show is the distribution of FST value in uh, a segment of the human genome. So we'd go, look at different protein coding genes in the human genome. And then for each of them, we calculate the average value of FST. So down on the x-axis, you have FST between different human populations. I think this is calculated comparing some Europeans to some Africans. And what you can see is most of the values are about sort of 0 0.05, 0 0.1, or maybe 0.15, relatively small. Human populations are not highly differentiated from each other. So FST is small. But in the occasion, you see some loci that have a really high value. And this, for example, one is not actually in this figure, but one that's called Doffy with an FST value at 0.65, a really high FST value. There's a large difference in allele frequencies between populations. What is that? Well, I think maybe I will uh, not, uh, I'll skip sort of too much of the biology of this story, but this Doffy lo lo locus, it is um, responsible for. Uh, resistance to a form of malaria in sub-Saharan Africa. So there's a very different allele frequency in this locus in Africa and outside Africa because positive selection has favored a certain variant inside Africa. So if we look at values of FST for that locus, 
it's really, really high compared to the overall distributions in, less, in the rest of the genome. So high value of FST is indicative or could be indi indicative of positive selection, if you, if, particularly if it's just one or few loci in the genome. And one of the outliers in the human genome is the Staphylococcus, where selection has been acting to increase resistance to malaria in sub-Saharan uh, populations. Okay, let me go through another example, biological example of selection. So this is perhaps the most famous example of selection in Europe, among Europeans. So it has to do with lactose intolerance. Remember, lactose is a carbohydrate that's in milk. So when you drink milk, a lot of the energy you get is from this carbohydrate lactose. What happens is that you have an enzyme lactase that digests lactose, is split lactose into glucose and galactose. Okay, so that's, uh, so if you don't have lactase, if that enzyme is not there, you can't digest lactose. So during childhood, as you're getting your mother's milk, expression of this gene is high. So it's, it's active this gene lact that encodes lactase and a lot of lactase has been produced so you can digest milk. But in people who are lactose intolerant, who, have a, who can't digest milk well as adults, that's because the expression of this gene stops, that you don't as an adult produce lactase. Okay, so uh, lactase decre activity decreases in everybody, but people that are lactose intolerant, it declines to 10 to 15% of that in early childhood. So now you can't digest milk anymore and you get lactose intolerance. One of the things that were noticed early on is that the frequency of uh, lactose intolerance is very different in different populations. So for example, I'm from Denmark, people that are originally from Denmark, many generations in the past, they lactose intolerance there is only about 2%. Almost nobody are lactose intolerant. Uh, I don't know what it is in Russia, but it's also relatively low in Russia. The exact number, I don't know, but slightly higher than Denmark as far as I remember. But if you look at some populations, uh, some other populations, it's very high. For example, if you look at people in South uh, uh, of Sahara, Sub-Saharan Africa, it's 75 to 100%. And in Southeast Asia, for example, in Thailand, the frequency of people lactose intolerant is also almost 100%. So this is massive difference, difference in lactose intolerance in between the populations. Now, people have figured out what is caused, uh, causing this. This particular genetic variant sitting upstream from the gene that controls its expression, how much has been produced, and the mutations there that has changed its regulation. So we know the mutations involved in this. There are specific variants, particular mutations that determine whether you have lactose intolerance or not, whether you as an adult produce lactase or not. Okay. And if you look then at FST in the region, so if it is clearly very high, it explains the difference between, say, Southeast Asians and Danish people. And if you look at the region around where, uh, where, where um, this gene that controls lactase production is, you can see there's this sort of peak of very high FST value right there around the LCT locus. So the LCT locus is the lactase locus, the ones that encodes uh, the lactase gene, that's the enzyme that breaks down lactose. In fact, the peak is a little bit to the left because this particular genetic element that controls the expression of lactase sits a bit upstream, sits a bit to the left of the gene. But there's this big FST peak there. Okay, so this is one example where FST is really high because of natural selection. And of course, what we think is going on here is that in Northern Europe, you have had dairy farming as a very, very important source of uh, nutrients, particularly in, in cold Northern European winters. And so there's been very, very strong selection to be able to digest milk. People that couldn't digest milk, that were lactose intolerant, they didn't survive. People that could, they survived. So there's been strong selection for lactase persistence for this genetic variant that allow you to produce lactase also as adults in Northern Europe. Whereas in Southeast Asia, where people haven't had dairy farming, they didn't have cows that they were milking, they didn't drink milk, there's been no selection. And that's what's caused this difference in FST, that there are genetic variants that's increased in frequency in Northern Europe to increase lactase persistence, the ability to drink milk as an adult, 
And there hasn't been that in Southeast Asia. And that's why we see this FST peak here if we go along the length of the chromosome. And so that's one example of a increased FST in humans due to selection. And there's several other examples of those. And this scanning for the genome, finding regions where FST is, is large, is one of the most common ways today of trying to find selection, to find where our population significantly differentiated. All right, so I'm gonna skip over this. And then I think um, I'm gonna end just talking uh, about some examples of, uh, of selection, uh, just where, where some of these principles that we talked about here, they've been used to, to detect selection. And I'm gonna take some examples from my own work. Let me just see how much time I've left. So we have about seven minutes to go through to where I can discuss some of those examples. So here's one example where what we looked at was altitude adaptation in Tibet. So people that live in Tibet, they live in an altitude of about four kilometers and so the amount of oxygen they get is about only 60% of what people that live at sea level get. So you are a strongly, it's called hypoxic, deprived, that means deprived of oxygen. You lack oxygen when you live in that high altitude. But the Tibetans are, are able to manage that surprisingly well. And one of the reasons why they do that is that they seem to have a different regulation of the production of red blood cells. So what we did, we want to figure out what's the genetic basis of this. <clears throat> so what we did was we sequenced uh, the genomes, or in fact, just the protein coding genes in the genomes for many Tibetans and Han Chinese. Han Chinese, that's again, this major ethnic group in China. And then we plotted the allele frequencies for the two groups. Okay. And you can see this is the allele frequency for the Tibetans on the x-axis, the allele frequency for the Hans on the y-axis. So this is this two-dimensional frequency spectrum, okay? And I mentioned that in the last lecture as well, in fact, showed this uh, two-dimensional frequency spectrum. And what I mentioned there was that it was clear that the Tibetans and the Han Chinese, they have very similar allele frequencies, because if you go along the diagonal here, most of the SNPs, most of the polymorphisms, they fall along this axis, where you have the same frequency in Tibet as you have in the Han Chinese. But there's some outliers, particularly some outliers where there's a high frequency in Tibetans and a relatively low frequency in the Han Chinese. Those outliers are all in and around a gene that's called EPAS1. And so what is EPAS1? Well, it's a gene that, con that regulates the production of uh, red blood cells. And what we could see, what we could do is then after I found this gene this way by looking at the allele frequencies, the difference in the allele frequency is that the hemoglobin concentration differs strongly between uh, people that have in a particular position in the genome a CC genotype versus the ones that have a GG genotype. And that shows uh, that much of the difference in the way red blood cell production is regulated that causes this difference in hemoglobin concentration is in fact caused by neck variants in or around this area of EPAS1. So by looking at natural selection, we could figure out what are the functionally important variants or what is the gene that's responsible for this difference between Tibetans and, and other populations in how the red blood cells are regulating. It's a very important reason to, uh, for Tibetans to function so well in high altitude and perhaps the primary reason why they don't tend to get uh, so much chronic mountain sickness as other people uh, do when they go up in high altitude. All right. A final example uh, I'll run through quickly is these people that live in Indonesia, uh, the Bajau sea nomads uh, that we've been starting. This project together with a collaborator of mine, Eskabilislev, and one of his students, Melissa Lado. And But this is a project that she really initiated uh, and because she was interested in these people. They're very, very interesting people. They have a very unique lifestyle. They live a marine-dependent lifestyle. They live on boats and coral reefs. And they've done that for a long time. And, and the way they get the food is that they dive. They can dive down to over 70 meters free diving. And maybe most impressively, they spend 60% of their working hour underwater. So they dive down, they come up, they dive down, and they spend more time underwater than above water. So that's just crazy conditions for your physiology. Most of the time during your work life, you're holding your breath. That's, that's a very extreme situation. So we're interested in how have they maybe adapted to that. And one of the things we're looking at is the diving reflex. 
So if you put your head into cold water and hold your breath, then uh, it elicits a reflex that involves several different things. It slows the heart rate, you get peripheral vasoconstriction, so that means that the blood goes into your central organs where it's near the most, and then your spleen will contract. And when the spleen contracts, then more red set blood cells, oxygenated red blood cells is being pumped into the bloodstream. So it's like you have a little diving tank with you internally in your body that when you go down diving, you actually can get more red blood cells that are oxygenated so you can better transport oxygen in your blood. So we have a biologically little built-in diving tank with us. And what we see in some organisms like some seals, that diving tank is much larger. They have large, large spleens. Okay, so uh, a, a female um, elephant seals might have a, a spleen that can weigh 100 kilograms. Okay, so they weight larger than a grown man. Uh, uh, so they have these massive spleens. So the question is, what happened to some of these diving people? So in, in, Melissa went down and, and took genetic samples and worked with them for a long time, lived down in the village, and also measured the size of the spleen of these people down there. And what she could show is, she did these sonograms of the spleen to measure the size of the spleen. And what she could show is these Bajau people have larger spleen sizes than other people, for example, the Salwans. And uh, the Salwans is another population that live nearby that doesn't die. Okay, so they have larger spleens, but of course there could be many reasons why they have larger spleens. But it could be a genetic effect. And one thing we looked at is whether people that dive in that population, people that don't dive, whether they have the same spleen sizes. It turns out they do. So it's not that diving seems to induce larger spleen sizes. It's, it's just that the Bajau for some other reason have larger spleen sizes. So possibly that could be a genetic effect it could be adaptation to the environment that they have genetic variants that have been under natural selection to increase in frequency that gave them larger spleens. So they have a bigger diamond tank, so to speak, when they go diving, the natural diamond tank we all are equip equipped with. Okay, so what we did then was that we looked throughout the genome and found position in the genome where the allele frequency was different in the Bajau, basically where they had a larger FST to other populations. And this is a list of the genes we found where the Bajau people, these diamond people, they have uh, differentiated from other populations if we calculate FST. And in particular one gene, PDN10A, where then it's, they all, it's also associated with larger spleen size. So we intersected that list of the genes that have our natural selection in Bajau with the one where the genetic variants that are associated with spleen size. And we found this gene that where we could show that in fact, individuals that have the Bajau genotype, they tend to have larger gene size than that. And we could replicate that in other populations that also have these variants, but a lower frequency, that also cause larger spleen size. So this is, a, if we go along the, the genome, we can see the selection signal here. This is something else we calculate. We have a probabilistic model, but it's similar to the FST calculation. And right in this particular position where this gene sits, there's a lot of evidence for selection. And there's also some evidence of association with spleen size that we could replicate in other populations. So we think in that uh, particular study, what we're able to show that selection has increased the spleen size uh, in the bad jowl, particularly by working on this particular gene, changing the allele frequency in this gene, uh, and uh, uh, so that they better are able to dive and can dive for uh, a longer time. Okay. So now we're one minute past the hour, but I, I want to give you an opportunity for you to ask more questions now, even though we are past time. Uh, if you have questions about any of the material from today or from any previous uh, lectures. Okay, I see there's the chat here, um, which I don't really see when I'm sharing the screen, but I can see now uh, that there are some questions there. I hope the one with interspecific and intraspecific has been explained. Now, there, I can see there's also uh, a good question, a good answer here from Dimitri uh, to that question. <clears throat> 
So then somebody also asked, is there any good reason why there's local maximum in 0.775? So which slide was that? Yeah, I, uh, when you show uh, F, uh, J, there was the, the graphic. Um, Sorry, I couldn't quite hear. Could you say that again? It's, uh, you show uh, about uh, 10, 10, 15 minutes ago um, a graph, a graphic where there were um, some uh, like histogram and there uh, is uh, uh, well actually maybe maybe I can see if I can find that the figure uh, so I'm going to share screen again and see if we can find the uh, I'll go back from here I believe it was an FST graph. There was FST yeah, graph. Yeah. Okay, FST. So this one here? No, no some slides. previous. Uh, yes, yes. Ah, but there's this one. So so these yeah. are some other genes. Okay, yeah. So so there are several genes that show um, really strong differentiation between human populations and. The strongest one, and I believe that this, these are actually genes that are associated with skin pigmentation. So if you yeah. ask in which genes in the human genome are humans most different from each other, if you look at sort of the big continental populations, people in Af Asia, Africa, and so on, we are by far the most differentiated if you look at skin color, eye color, and hair color. And all the top five genes that show the strongest differentiation between human population are all associated with that. So there's some sort of interesting ways to think about that. And in fact, genetically, we are much more similar to each other than what you would predict from looking at skin color. Skin color is where we are most different from each other of anything genetically. So you can say, why is that? I didn't talk much about skin pigmentation, but why is there so much differentiation there? Well, there's been a lot of natural selection associated being, being in a very hot tropical environment with a lot of sun versus being in a colder environment with much less sun. And the way it works is that if there's a lot of uh, sun, then of course you need to protect yourself against the UV radiation, not to get sunburned. And then it's better to have a lot of skin pigmentation. But if you live in more a northern climate where there's much less sun, if you have too much skin pigmentation, you don't produce enough vitamin D because you need sun exposure to produce vitamin D. And so there we think there's been natural selection against having too much skin pigmentation. There are also other hypotheses that it has to do with sexual selection and other things like that. But it's certainly this thing about this, the protection against UV light versus vitamin D production seems to have been important. So we had this pattern of human populations that the ones that live, say, in Africa and certain in Australia and certain part of Southeast Asia, they all have evolved high skin, uh, dark skin pigmentation. But people living in, say, you know, Russia or Denmark or United Kingdom, they have much less skin pigmentation because they would, you know, that was detrimental to have too much skin pigmentation because it inhibited vitamin D production. And so it's an example of where local selection has created big differences between human groups. Uh, and in fact, the best example that we have of that, I would say. Yeah, I see, thanks. All right, are there any other um, more questions? All right, so this was sort of a, a very fast paced overview of many different things in population genetics. And I know many of you, all of the details might have been hard to follow all the details because I covered quite a lot of material that I usually cover over a whole semester. But I wanted to give you a sort of window into all of the different sort of aspects of population genetics and all the different things that are going on. And perhaps that gives you an opportunity to pursue more knowledge about this yourself uh, as you have been introduced to many, many, many different topics in population genetics. And hopefully it'll also give you some background for the next segments of the class that are coming up now that has to do with more the nitty gritty bioinformatics about how to analyze data. Uh, that uh, the next six le lectures were,
will focus on. So I hope that this sort of background on questions and ideas in population genetics has also will help motivate the next lectures where you really go in much more detail with the, the bioinformatics uh, and the data analysis. Okay, so I'll end there. Uh, I see oh, there's, there's a new message. Could you send us presentations, please? Yes, I will send you the slides. Uh, I'll send them to Vladimir and uh, he will then make sure that uh, you all get, uh, get. Mm -hmm. So it, it's fine to publish them on the page, web page of the school? Sure, that's fine, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, just, yeah pop, may, we'll make them into PDF format and you can put them there. Yeah, that's all. Fine, you. thank you. Ross. Actually, uh, I wonder why no one asked about uh, do you have any suggestions uh, about the textbooks which people could read? Uh, I'm gonna, of course going to recommend, if you are uh, from biology background but interested in understanding the uh, math more, I'm going to recommend my own book that I wrote together with Monty Slatkin on population genetics. I wrote it because I think that's the way it should be explained. But of course, there are other books out there. And if you're more, if you're from, from the mathematical sciences, if you have a strong background in probability theory, I, Rick Durrett has a book. Uh, D-U-R-R-E-T-T -T. and Vladimir can also give you that the, the, a link to that book that I think is a, is a very good book uh, for introducing many ideas in, in population genetics. So it depends a bit on I think what, the, what your background is which book is good. But for the biologist I think I would recommend my own book. I can't help myself but doing that. I wrote it because I think that that was the right way of doing things. So of course I'm going to recommend that but there are other books out there. I take no offense if you rather take one of the other books. And then I think for the one from the mathematical sciences, there are other books that are written by mathematicians specifically to introduce these topics to people with a mathematical background. And if you have strong mathematical background, I'll recommend the book, I think, by Rick Durrett. I think that's the best book out there. Oh, okay. thank you very much, Rasmus. And, well, thank you. Uh, it was like three brilliant lectures. And uh, let's thank once again, Professor Nilsson. Well, thank you also for listening to me. I know it was very sort of fast paced, uh, but there will be no exam in the end where you have to have memorized all of this. So uh, maybe that helps a little bit. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed it, even if it was a little fast paced. All right. Yes. And uh, I hope everyone can write you like an email with some questions. That would be nice, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much, everybody. So thank you again, Rasmus. And, you. Uh, can you please transfer to me the host? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Erasmus, -bye. Bye, thank you again.